we're going to start this lesson on mutation by actually talking about DNA. Because if you don't have a good understanding of the structure of DNA, then unfortunately, what happens for a mutation and how that then causes a problem is going to be a little bit mystical. So we're going to start off with a, a brief overview, broad scale, on chromosomes themselves. So if we think about a chromosome, something like this with a centromere. We're not going to get into all the details of chromosomes and chromatids and all of that stuff. The wonderful things that come when you do mitosis. Okay, so the idea here is just to understand a bit of the structure. So a chromosome is made up of DNA and protein. So in each of these arms, we've got DNA all squiggled up around proteins. If we take out a piece of this DNA, we see we've got that double helix that we talked about when we looked at DNA structure. So there's our double helix, and that's a whole long string of A, T's, G's, and C's, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, purines, pyrimidines, double helix, same space, hydrogen bonds, all of those things are playing in here. But what we're gonna pull out in particular is a discrete piece of DNA. Let's say that piece of DNA. That piece of the DNA is a gene. Okay? And a single gene is a length of DNA that codes for a single polypeptide. So remember, a polypeptide is your primary structure of your protein. Okay, it is just amino acids and the sequence in which they occur. So this is what we're talking about here. This gene has that information. So how does it have that information? How do we get from, from letters into information? That's where our genetic code comes in. Through our DNA, we have a sequence of bases. Remember, if you think about it, you've got your phosphate, your sugar, and your base. Okay, and we're joining the sugar phosphate backbone. So all the bases stick out, and then they hydrogen bond to the other side. And hydrogen bond depend on whether you've got AT or GC and all of that fun stuff that we talked about when we talked about DNA structure. And everything is upside down and it all gets fun. Okay, but you get the idea. So it's this sequence of these bases. What are the bases? They are adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine. Remember also that we have complementary base pairing. So we have a very assured way of getting this precise sequence. What's important now is we think about, okay, how does this random collection, A, T, T, C, or G, C, A, A, C, C, G, how does this actually make any sense? Because this is what we've got. And we've got millions of these going down. It's like, okay, great, so what? What we've got is built into this is a code. It's brilliant, so you can be a detective. Okay, so what you have in DNA is you have a triplets code. Okay, so you would take three of these bases and that then forms a triplet. So each three is a different triplet. And we have a special triplet for start, so we know where to start reading this code. And then we have a 
three special treat, three special triplets for stop. So we always know when we're reading the code where we start and where we stop. So we know which groups of three we must be reading. So in DNA, we have our triplet. Let's say, for example, we have A, C, G. Now, remember this DNA, this is your instructions in your nucleus. But when we want to actually turn this into a protein, that's happening in the cytoplasm. So we need to get this instructions out. That's where our mRNA comes in. So here we have the process of transcription. Okay, in mRNA, we don't call them triplets anymore. Now we call them codons. And they are complementary. So in mRNA, we would have U, G, C in this example. Because we don't have T's in RNA, we have U's instead. So A to U, C to G, G to C. So this one is our messenger RNA. He takes the instructions from the nucleus into the cytoplasm. And particularly then to the ribosomes. Because that's where the next step takes place. Okay, so we have then tRNA. We have this now instructions, this UGC saying, this is what we need. This is our code. What's it coding for is a specific amino acid. But the amino acids can't see this, this base code. What they see is tRNA. So tRNA collects an amino acid and it has an anticodon. This one's going to be U, A, so U to A, G to C, C to G. So here we're going to bring the correct amino acid. So what we have is one triplet codon anticodon for one amino acid. Okay, it's very specific. So if we have this specific anticodon, this specific tRNA with this anticodon is going to pick up a specific amino acid. For example, if in your DNA, let's just talk about the specificity of this, we have an AAG. You're going to get the amino acid PAG. There's a wonderful um, dictionary at the back of your textbook that goes through the whole codes and what amino acids they stand for. You don't have to learn it, but it can be quite interesting to have a look at. So the other one is, if you just change that last base. So from a G to a T, you end up with a completely different amino acid. So this is, is, this is the sort of way we're going with this lesson. This lesson is not about genetic code and reading genetic code. This is about how subtle the change needs to be so that we can understand the genetic code in terms of mutation. So we have a very specific amino acids, which are coded for by the DNA. So that triplet code in the DNA is crucial because it's that triplet code that ultimately affects what amino acid is going to be incorporated into your polypeptide. And if you think about it way back to protein structure, when you have a different amino acid, you have a different R group. When you have a different R group, you're going to affect the tertiary and potentially quaternary bonding of this protein. You're going to change the shape of the protein. Because some of those R groups are dramatically different. 
So therefore, they'll have different bonding capabilities to what you have if you're going to change that amino acid. So bottom line is DNA has a triplet. That triplet is the ultimate decider of what amino acid is going to get incorporated into our polypeptide when we build our protein. Are we happy? Let us now step through this toward mutation. Mutation is one of those dictionary definitions that you need to sit and learn because it is a, a definition that actually comes up in the exams. And that's your definition. A change in the sequence of nucleotides, bases in particular, that may result in an altered polypeptide. So remember DNA is built of nucleotides, that nucleotide is the phosphate, the sugar, and the base, okay? If you change the order of those, then you could be changing what your code is, and that may result in an altered polypeptide. It doesn't always, okay? So let us first think about what kind of changes we could have, and then we'll talk a bit about why we say may result, not will result. So different types of mutation. We can have an insertion mutation. So here, we have an extra nucleotide added in. We could have a deletion. We could have removal of a nucleotide. We could have substitution. Which is simply replacement. Also, all of these could happen with more than one nucleotide. The other one that's interesting because it comes up in memos, it's not actually straight out there in your textbook, but this is an inversion mutation. So I'll put this one in brackets. Here, a segment of the DNA is reversed. So let's just put examples next to each of these. So extra nucleotide added. Let's say, let's start with ATT. Okay, we'll start with ATT in each case. And then we can have a look at what happens. So for an insertion, we're going to add an extra nucleotide. For example, we could have a G T T. For a dilute de deletion, we're going to remove one. So for example, we could just have TT, the A is gone. For substitution, we're just going to swap one out. So let's say A, T, then instead of having a T, we have an A. And then for the last one, for an inversion, okay, we're going to reverse it. So instead of being ATT, we become TTA. And they would all be in orange because they're all being affected. So you can see that these first two are slightly different to the second two. The first two we have an even bigger problem than just our change in bases. Here we've gone from three 
our triplet, three, our triplet. Now we've got four. But remember, we've already passed our start. So we're still going to read this code as a three. So we're going to read a G T instead of a T T. And the T will then move into the next triplet. Here, we would have to pull in whatever was downstream so that we get TT something else because we can't just read the TT on our own. We need to always read in three. So these two are also called frame shifts. Because they shift the triplets series. Every single triplet after this mutation is going to be affected. Whereas here, with substitution, we are affecting only one single triplet. The inversion can be an entire triplet, it can be seven triplets in a row, because it can be a whole piece that's sort of cut out and flipped around. It's a very funky process, but beyond the scope. So just be aware of it that that is an interesting one. Um, but what you're focusing on is insertion, deletion, and substitution. So this is now how a mutation can actually happen. The problem is, of course, when we change our DNA, what happens next? When you change your DNA, then you're going to change your mRNA. Because when the mRNA is built, it doesn't sort of go saying, oh, well, you should be a this, you should be a that. It says, you are a, you are a, you are a. And it's complementary basis every single time. So if we change the mRNA, then we're also going to change the tRNA. And if we change the tRNA, we can get a different amino acid. If we get a different amino acid in built, then we can have a different polypeptide. And there we can change the protein structure. So all it takes is one little change within our DNA because everything is so tightly linked from the DNA all the way through to the end of translation that we are copying and we are believing that DNA code absolutely, totally, completely, implicitly. Okay, that's why we need to protect that DNA code so much because it needs to last, it needs to be stable, it needs to be strong, it needs to be looked after so that we don't get these mutations. So this is how mutation happens. We change our sequence. May result in an altered polypeptide. Let's talk about that. may result in an altered polypeptide means that sometimes it may not. We actually have three different types of mutation. We have silent mutations. We have detrimental mutations. And we actually have even beneficial mutations. A silent mutation, how can that happen? Okay, silent mutation means that actually the amino acid doesn't change. So we change our DNA, we change our mRNA, we change our tRNA, and yet we get the same amino acid. This is because we have a degenerate code. Regen, all right, code. 
We have more different triplets than we have different amino acids. So yes, we only have one triplet that says start, but we have, for example, we could have four different triplets that code for a single amino acid. So if we make a substitution change and it is within that group for an amino acid, then it doesn't matter that our DNA changed. Our mutation is silent because our amino acid didn't change. So it's still a mutation, but it is a silent one because even though there was a change, there is no effect on the final protein. The amino acid is exactly the same. The R group is therefore exactly the same. And the further levels of protein structure will form exactly as they always did. Detrimental mutations are where things get a little bit more interesting. Here we end up with a dysfunctional protein. So in this case, you get the wrong amino acid. Remember, if it's a frame shift mutation, it might be more than one. So wrong amino acids incorporated. And now you're going to end up with a protein with a different shape. And if it has a different shape, so much stands on protein shape. Function is linked to structure. So when we have then the wrong shape, we don't have the function. So function of protein depends on structure. So if we change the structure, we can completely remove that function. Think of an enzyme. If you change the shape of that enzyme active site, and you can do that just with a single amino acid, then you've got a problem because when the active site changes shape, it's no longer complementary to your substrate. And now you've got a dysfunctional protein. So in some cases, um, this can lead to, to death of the organism even, if it's so dysfunctional that it's, it's not going to actually work. Um, and there's all sorts of interesting levels of, of things that can go on here. And, and some um, genetic diseases are, are examples of, of things like this. Um, so if, you, if this is the sort of thing that intrigues you, go and, and look it up, get yourself some more context into it. This is also um, an, an interesting thing with, with sickle cell because uh, sickle cell is, is a wrong in, amino acid incorporation, but Sickle cell is not always detrimental. If you think back to your Ig biology and, and studying malaria, okay, so when you have sickle cell in certain areas of the world, if you're, you're heterozygous for sort of sickle cell anemia, then you actually have a competitive advantage because you're not susceptible to the same extent for malaria. And that sort of leads us into now the beneficial mutations. So here, you have a mutation and you change your amino acid, but you end up with a superior protein. So now you get an organism, perhaps with an, an even better enzyme. Okay, now this is what we're needing to for the basis of natural selection. Because as soon as you have something that's superior, then you can have a selection pressure. So something as simple as a single base mutation can actually change our protein in such a way that it becomes superior, giving an, um, a, a selective advantage to an organism and leading to the process of natural selection. So what are you focusing on in 
in AS biology, it is, it is these two. It's your detrimental mutation and your silent mutation. Okay. Sickle cell is taken as an example of a detrimental mutation because there you have a substitution. You're changing your CTC to a CAC. Okay. Single base substitution. Okay. But it changes the amino acid. And you're changing from a polar amino acid to a non-polar amino acid. And think of all of those bonding types in your final protein structure that are dependent on polarity, how important polarity is. So when we change that in our sickle cell, in just one polypeptide, the, the beta chain, so it's a beta globin of our hemoglobin, so there's actually two of them, okay? But what it changes is it changes the whole interaction of that molecule, because now instead of having a polar group on the outside, we have a non-polar group. Now we put that protein into the aqueous cytoplasm of a cell, and now all the non-polar bitties want to get together. And, and that, that clumping of the hemoglobin changes the entire shape of the red blood cell. I mean, this impact is massive from one base substitution. So it's really important that you, you've got the context of how important my genetic code is. You know, that structure of the DNA is crucial. And then the maintaining the integrity through transcription, through translation, I and mean, we believe in that DNA and we follow its instructions absolutely completely. So if our DNA changes, if we have a mutation, then we change everything that then follows on. And we end up with potentially a detrimental mutation. Could be silent because of our degenerate code, but very often we could have a detrimental mutation and we change our protein.